Good morning. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> it is good to see all of your faces this morning. Uh, I'm Stephanie. Uh, this morning I got clutter. I got stuff going on. I hope clutter doesn't bother you. Uh, I am the director of adult discipleship here at Christ Center. And this morning we are in a series called I Quit. I quit, okay? And I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I've felt that way many times. I'm done. I'm over it. I quit. And today we're going to talk about quitting striving. And the definition, I want to give you the definition of to strive. To strive is to make great effort to achieve or obtain something. So you're putting great effort into achieving or obtaining. So here's some examples. Maybe you make great effort to get that to-do list done. I'm going to tell you it's probably not going to happen, but you can keep trying to get that to-do list done. Maybe it's putting great effort into cleaning your house for company. Maybe getting the food prepped for a special event. Maybe shoveling snow off the roof and the driveway before the rain comes, right? Um, getting a promotion, getting straight A's, raising perfect children, doing a side hustle. Uh, maybe it is alleviating other people's pain. I don't know about you, but I tend to be drawn to putting great effort into keeping people from pain or helping them when they're feeling pain. Maybe going to college, I might have said that already, without debt. That's a big one at our house. Okay, um, buying a house, building a house, making another person happy, maybe even great effort toward leading someone to the love, the hope, the goodness of God. Well, in and of itself, those things aren't bad, so why are we talking about quitting striving? We know that stuff needs to get done. If you are a doer, you know what I'm talking about, right? And we doers can get it done. We know how we're gifted, we're good at it, we're checking those boxes. I'm literally a moth drawn to the light when it comes to this, to striving. I like it. I like seeing that challenge out there, that to-do list and checking those boxes. So a couple years ago, Christ Center looked at Steve and I and they said, you're tired, <laughs> you need a break. And so they did what in the church world is called a sabbatical and they sent us away for a few months to regroup, recoup, uh, have some serious on our face with God time, ask God to affirm and confirm that we were still supposed to be the leadership here at Christ Center and to strengthen us if that was the case and to keep us going forward. So we're preparing for this sabbatical, and we've never been on one. We didn't really know what it was, but we were excited to try it out. And uh, on my Instagram feed, I kept seeing this thing called the 75 Hard Challenge. Tagline, a tactical guide to winning the war with yourself. Now, I didn't really think I was at war so much with myself, but I like a challenge. So challenge accepted. I am in. I'm doing this thing. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put great effort. I'm telling myself this, right? I'm psyching myself up. Great effort into being a winner according to some standard set by some guy that I don't know named Andy Frizzola who has 19,000 followers. If I can do this, I am better than all the losers out there. Andy's words, not mine. Okay, so Andy, that's his, that's his tagline. You're better than all the losers. Okay, so that probably should have been my first clue, but I'm a little stubborn. Okay, so this is what the challenge is. The challenge is you have to work out twice a day. One of those has to be outside. Even if there's a tornado in your neighborhood, doesn't matter. One of them has to be outside. If you miss a day on any of these things, you have to start back at day one. Okay, you guys are all like, why are we listening to her? <laughs> okay. Okay, so two times a day, you have to follow a diet of your choosing, no alcohol, take a progress picture every day, read 10 pages of a book every day, and drink a gallon of water every day. Now, I cannot remember how many days into this I was, but I know I was over halfway. Steve was kind of my, my partner in crime, but I mean, he knew it was crazy, so he only would kind of he liked the two-a-day workout, so he was in with that part of it. But I don't remember how many days I was in. And on this particular day, I learned two new words. I didn't know these words. Water intoxication. A medical term for sodium imbalance in the body. Early symptoms include nausea, 
vomiting, headache, confusion, disorientation, and I am going to add to this list severe heartburn. Not just a little heartburn. Like heartburn, honey, I think you have to take me to the hospital. I think I'm dying heartburn. What I learned on that day is that my body was not created to sustain a gallon of water a day. And this is where I learned a hard truth. In our human nature, we often act first, accept the challenge first, commit to putting the effort in first before we ask. Before we ask our creator, our Lord, our leader, before we ask him to give us wise counsel, we just jump in. I'm in. I'm doing this thing. My point is this. I think where many of us need to quit striving, right? We're talking about quitting striving. Striving in and of itself, putting effort into something isn't bad. But that place where that great effort becomes unhealthy. You're putting in the effort, you're putting in the effort, and it becomes unhealthy. And I want you to hear these words. It's at that point where we recognize, I am not enough. I'm not enough. I've hit the ceiling. I can't do this. There came that point for me in the 75 hard challenge. It became unhealthy. I almost ended up in the hospital. And I realized I was living up to an unrealistic standard that I was holding myself to. I wanted to be a winner, according to some guy named Andy. It tells you where I was at at that point in my life. Sometimes we are striving after self-induced standards. We put these things on ourselves. Sometimes we're striving after a standard that somebody else has set for us. Maybe you're a pleaser and you're trying to always please. Uh, maybe you are trying to, striving to live up to the standards that other human beings have put on you. Maybe there's human traditions. I mean, think of Christmas. There's so many things in Christmas that we do that probably we could, we could let it go. Um, social media. Social media will try to tell you that this is what beautiful is, and this is the standard you have to live up to. And so we strive to be beautiful according to social media. Maybe we're putting, again, great effort toward accomplishing expectations of ourselves or others. And at some point, we hit that not enough. Each of us hit it. And wisdom, this is what I want to say right here, wisdom would say to us, listen, listen to that, those words. When you hear those words, not enough, pay attention. Don't feel guilty. I think that's what we do. I think we fall into this self-hatred almost of like, man, I'm weak. What's wrong with me? Why can't I do other people do 75 hard? Why can't I do 75 hard? And we get mad at ourselves. We get hard on ourselves. Instead, I would recommend that we listen. We pay attention to that voice. The words not enough may be like an internal alarm inside of us going off, lights flashing, <laughs> warning, warning. Those words are trying to tell us something. And I'm wondering, what is that place in your life? where you're hitting that space, I'm not enough. Man, why can't I do this? Feels like everybody else is doing it. Why can't I do it? What's wrong with me? What is that place for you? I had this happen to me not very long ago. Um, I, as I shared earlier, I am a bit of, a, I want people to be happy. Like, I really want people to be happy. And I can feel people's unhappiness a mile away. I have a radar. <gasps> that person's not happy. Oh my gosh, that person's not happy. And I, I jump in and I try to make them happy. I try to fix it for them. And I just have this tendency. And I was laying in bed because I had, in probably a month's time, I had failed like four people. Four people were mad at me because I couldn't be what they needed me to be in that moment. And I was just laying in bed and I was just feeling like, man, you know, something, something's off here. Something's wrong. There's a story in the Bible, many, many of us have heard this story, maybe we've heard it many times, and it's the story of two sisters, Martha and Mary. But I think it is worth repeating because I think most of us can find ourselves somewhere in the story. So we're at the home of Martha and Mary, and this is the story out of the Bible. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, Jesus came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. 
She came to Jesus and she said, Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. So the first word I want to look at in this story is the word distracted. In the Hebrew, to the best of my ability, it's perespao. Now, listen to this. It means to be drawn off from around. I'll say it again. Drawn off from around. The first time I heard this definition, I immediately thought of an old school merry-go-round. I think we're going to get a picture up there of an old school merry-go-round. Uh, in a minute, if you don't know what they were. Anybody that went to school in my day and age, um, they had these on the playground. And um, what would happen, so it's this round toy with like these metal arms on it, and all of us kids would get around it, and we would grab on and we would run, and we would just get that thing going and going and going and going, and then we would jump on it and we would spin around. And it was really fun until one kid inevitably would go flying off the thing. And usually they would hit the cement, they would hit the hard dirt, you know, rarely were these things actually on grass. And so it was fun until it wasn't. And this idea of getting um, drawn off from around is what is happening here with Martha when it says that she's distracted. It means that she became overburdened, worried, or anxious about what she was doing to the point that she was drawn away from her purpose of what she was doing. So she was drawn away from her purpose. And we can get so caught up ourselves in doing all the preparations, all the many things, that we get distracted and we miss the real meaning and purpose of our lives. Martha became overburdened by serving. Uh, Martha took very seriously her responsibility to show hospitality to Jesus. And you can imagine, I mean, can anyone else out relate with Martha? Jesus is coming to my house. Of course we're going to have 50 to-do lists, the sheets and the bathrooms and the mirrors and the windows and the food and all this. I mean, Jesus is coming to my house. So I'm not giving Martha a hard time here because we fall so easily into this trap. Okay, this is the problem, though. At some point, it went to a place where it became about Martha. The serving actually became about Martha. And this is my suspicions as to why it became about Martha. Martha was focused on the cultural expectation around hospitality, right? We all know that there are cultural expectations. Christmas time, how many of us bought a house based on where we could hang the stockings? right? There's a cultural expectation that you hang Christmas stockings. But really, okay, but so Martha had all these expectations. Maybe Martha's desire to do it right, to be responsible, to please Jesus. Maybe Martha's desire to be seen, to be seen, maybe is valuable or maybe even perfect. Like, look at me. Look at what a good host I am, right? We're not going to, like, say that out loud, but our hearts want that. We want to be seen. We want to be valued. We want to be acknowledged. And so I think Martha was struggling with that a little bit. Martha's desire to be understood. I'm given my gift. Of course I'm going to be a little frantic. I'm in charge of all the things. Of course I'm going to be stressed out, right? Martha's desire to be justified. Hey, Jesus, the reason it's not perfect is my sister Mary. She's not pulling her weight. These are all Martha's desires. These are the things that Martha desires. But what did Jesus desire? He just desired a place, simply a place, to tell people about the love of his Father, about the saving grace that he was going to offer to everybody, and about what going forward would look like in the kingdom of God, in the eternal He just needed a place to talk to people. The breakdown, where it gets unhealthy, remember we talked about striving in and of itself is okay, but where it gets unhealthy is when Martha is recognizing that she is not enough 
for the many things. She needs help, and instead of going to her source, she looks to another human being. And then she gets mad at that human being because that human is not meeting her expectations. Have you ever been frustrated with someone for not pulling their weight? I'm guilty, okay? So Martha brings her frustrations to Jesus. Now, it's not wrong that we bring our frustrations to Jesus, but the timing of this wasn't great. Jesus was on mission. He had X amount of minutes, X amount of days, X amount of years to get his message out. He was on mission. It was a pretty, like, we got to do this time. And it became about Martha. And Martha's like, Jesus, my sister's not helping me. Tell her to help me. You know, she becomes a little bit whiny in that moment, a little angsty. And uh, she's missing out on moving the mission of Jesus forward. And she's taking away from the mission of Jesus. And it is here, Jesus in his goodness, his kindness, his grace, gently brings her a little reprioritization. I had to practice saying that word. It's a hard word to say. Reprioritization. Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things. And only a few things are needed. Martha, you're worried about offering five different kinds of meat and making sure that closet in the back that nobody is even going to see is clean. Nobody's going to our attic. We don't have to have our attic organized before the people come over. Right? But Martha, you're worried about all this stuff. Only a few things are needed to give the mission of God. And then he goes on crazy to say, actually, only one thing is needed. And Mary is doing it. What is Mary doing in this story? She's sitting and she's listening to Jesus. Mary has chosen what is better. In using the word better, Jesus says that. Mary has chosen what is better. What he is saying is that there is value in both. There, we are called to serve, absolutely. We don't get to walk out of here today and go, oh, good, <laughs> I get pajama day every day. Okay, we don't get to do that. But he's saying she chose the better thing. We know that Jesus calls us to serve But the only way, listen to this, the only way to do it without hitting that wall of not enough or that place of frustration with others is to first be like Mary, sitting and listening. When I worked with students, I called this God time. That was my thing. That was my word. And I would say to them when they would get angsty, I was like, have you had your God time lately? You're mad at your mom and dad? Go have your God time and then come back and talk to me. Okay, and God time was a big thing. And I would say to them, we have vacation time, we have school time, we have free time, we have academic time, we have family time, we have work time. We need to have God time. And we need to have it first. It's the best thing. We are also challenged to prioritize. And I think this is like, It's just a constant reminder that we need in 2022 in our culture today. We need this constant reminder, this constant challenge. Right, God time. Okay, so when we choose God time first, our not enough is met with the all-sufficiency of Jesus through the working of the Holy Spirit. So what exactly is God time? I think God time looks different for everybody. We know that Mary sat and listened to Jesus. We can't today, we can't go, hey, Jesus, um, could you meet me at Weeds this week at like 3 o'clock on Wednesday? Right, we can't do that. But we can still listen to the word of God. This book, this book is valuable, it's important. If we are true followers of Christ, this needs to be our priority, sitting with this. The Old Testament is filled with, why are we here? Why did God make humans? Who is God? What does God want? What is God doing? Um, Oh, man, us humans are like that, really? Oh, well, you might as well just wipe us off. Oh, wait, there's hope coming. There's a Savior coming. And then we get to the New Testament, and we literally, in most of our Bibles, Jesus' words are in red. So we literally see the words of Jesus in our New Testaments, and we can sit with those words. 
We can learn of the character of this God that we show up every Sunday to learn about. We can do that. We can sit with the word of God. I also love the Psalms. I think the Psalms in our Bibles give us beautiful pictures of God time. I'm going to read a little bit of Psalm 1 to you guys, and I'm going to read a couple lines, and then I'm going to say something about them. So the first line in Psalm 1 I'm going to read to you is this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. Now, as I was reading commentaries on this, I loved this. It said, one of the commentaries said this, there is a joy in not turning our attention in the wrong direction. There is nothing inherently wrong about doing 75 hard. God might even tell one of you guys, do it for the kingdom. But I wasn't doing it for the kingdom. I was doing it for me. I really, I mean, I'm going to be honest. Um, Okay, so I was doing it for me, and I was listening to a voice. I'm not saying Andy Frizzola is wicked, but I'm saying in our very nature, us humans are often very misguided. So if we're looking to another human being, to get our direction, we're looking in the wrong place. We should be looking here. So this, this verse says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in this book. They delight in the law of the Lord. I wrote this down in the moment. I thought it was fun. We can look in the wrong direction or we can look in the book. I can look to social media, human expectations, and standards, or I can do as the writer of the psalm, and I can delight in this book, meditating on it day and night. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I hear the word meditate, I'm like, oh, that's weird. Like, you know, you get this picture of the person sitting cross-eyed, you know, doing that. Okay, but the Hebrew people, they meditated on God's um, word. And here's some of the things they did. The first thing that they did in a meditation with God is they quietly repeated a scripture over and over. Now, I think this is really important because we are getting messages all the time from the world, from other human beings, from the news, from social media, from all the things. We're getting constantly bombarded, right? And so I think this is the counteraction to that. So they would just say the scripture over and over. So it might look like this. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. This is what they did. They just started to repeat a section of scripture, and they let it just minister to them to get in here and to get in here and to maybe deal with some of those false things, thinkings that we took on during the day or during the week. Abandoning outside distractions. Oh, I was going to bring up my phone and I was going to put it over there. Take off my watch because I get notifications and put it over there. Oops, I got out of the box. Um, Maybe it is putting a note on your door that says, I am having a very important meeting with God right now. Do not bother me unless the house is on fire. Okay, maybe it's that. Maybe it's going and sitting in your car, sneaking out to your car when nobody knows, and sitting in your car for 20 minutes and having that God time. Um, I tell you, I fought for this over the years when I had young children. I fought for this because I couldn't survive without it. Um, Some of the things I did, I did a swap for a while with a friend. I would do Mondays, she would do Tuesdays. I would take the kids for two hours on Mondays. She would take them for two hours on Tuesdays. And I knew that every Tuesday, I got two hours of solid God time. Uh, Maybe it's hiring a babysitter. We make a way when we have to go to the dentist, when we have to get our hair done, when we have to go to the doctor's appointment, when we have to have coffee with our friends, we make a way. So we need to make a way to have this God time, to make it a priority, and that's what the Hebrew people did. Um, Praying intense prayers. And I'm really going to take a moment here because there's a reason. This is such an important one to me personally. 
So I've already told you guys, I woke up one day just with the realization of how many people I had failed and let down. And I'm a pleaser. That did not feel good. I couldn't, I just couldn't find rest. And then I realized I'm not enough. I, plain, and neither are you. We're not enough. We can't save them. We can't keep them from pain. We can't fix it for them. We can't make them happy all the time. As my, and I was doing pretty good for a while. For a while, I was kind of, I was, yeah, oh, okay. Oh, oh, you need, okay, okay, okay. Oh, 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 over here. Oh, mom's not happy with me. Okay, oh, 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 my kid's missing out on mom time. Okay. And then after a while, it just came crashing in. I'm like, I can't, it's not sustainable. And this is the answer to that. Praying intense prayers. Oh, right. God can. God is able. God is kind and good and loving. And he cares more about that person even than me. And he knows exactly what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm winging it. He knows what to do. Oh, right. So this intense prayer time gets me in the proper posture. I'm no longer trying to be Savior and trying to be God. I'm just trying to be a human being that, like, loves God, right? So that's a really important one. And then the last one, getting lost in communion with God. And there's a verse, one of my favorites, that says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that he is God. It is so hard in our culture to be still and quiet. It's so hard, but you got to fight for it. I usually start my God time with that quiet, and I just get myself where I need to be. And again, I fight for this time. I'm not saying it's easy. It's one of the hardest things you will ever do. 75 hard challenge, try Try seven days of God time challenge, right? It's hard. Okay, so being still. Um, usually after my stillness, it's like I start thanking God for his unconditional love. I think, honestly, every time I talk to God, I thank Jesus for saying yes to the pain of the cross for me. I can't help myself. I'm so grateful that he said yes. It's the only way I can have relationship with my Abba Father, and he did that for me. I give praise, I give praise for just the earthly blessings that we have. We have shelter, we have water, we have friends, we have people, we have coffee. I mean, so I do, I say thank you for these things. Um, Sometimes I will say, God, do you want to talk to me? I'll just quiet myself. Sometimes I'll get nothing, sometimes I'll start thinking about dinner, you know, what I need to make for dinner and I need to go to the store, that happens. But... It's a discipline. It's a habit. It's something we learn and we get better at with practice, and I will listen. And sometimes it's, hey, Steph, I want you to write a card and put some money in it and take it to so-and-so. Sometimes it's, um, sister, you got some sin in your life, and you need to go and make it right with that person. And don't do anything else until you deal with that. Sometimes it's um, just this knowing that something that day is going to be a challenge for me, and I need from scripture. Sometimes I'll get a scripture like, oh, I should read the book of James, you know, or something. And so I'll I'll go. It's not so formulated. It's just more like I let God's spirit lead me. And again, it's a practice and it's a discipline and you get better with it over time. Okay, so back to the psalm. These people that meditate on this book, that have God time, they are like trees planted along the riverbanks bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all that they do, but not the wicked. Okay, the wicked are the wrong direction people, okay? Oh, I'm looking at Andy Frizzla. In and of himself, I'm not saying he's wicked, but I'm just saying he might have more of a human agenda than Jesus has of the Jesus mission, right? So if I'm looking over there, I start to man-please, and I start to self-please. I start to want to please other people, I want them to think good of me, and I want to take care of myself. And it says that these people are like worthless chaff. And a chaff is an empty husk of grain 
It has no weighty substance to stabilize it. It is easily blown by the winds of adversity. And I would say COVID was a good test of where we're all at in our stability. Um, so easily blown by the winds of adversity. And if that's us, God time is the answer. And I can be this. I can be this chaff so easily, but I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being so easily blown around by whatever the latest bad thing is that's happening in our world. I'm tired of striving in an unhealthy way where I keep hitting, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I failed that person. I failed at this project. I'm failing at this. I'm tired of that feeling. I was created for more and for better. You were created for more and for better. I was created a masterpiece of God, and you were created a masterpiece of God. And this masterpiece was created for good works, and you are created for good works. For more, you're created for more than being blown around by the challenges of this life with no substance. I want to put in effort into things that cannot be taken away. And here, back to the Martha and Mary story, this is the most beautiful part of the story. Mary sat and listened to Jesus, and Jesus said to Martha, what Mary did can never be taken away from her. What Martha was doing, whatever she put out on the table that day and how clean the bathroom was, the bathroom's going to get dirty tomorrow. It's going to be taken away. This body that needed to be so strong, so it needed to do 75 hard, it's going to be taken away. But my time here with my creator, my God time, that can never be taken away from me. God's word says it to us like this. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Every single one of us in this room was created to do something to further the mission of Jesus. Jesus also said it like this. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But then listen to this. These are Jesus' next words. Apart from me... You can do nothing. So when we hit that place of I'm not enough, remember that warning? Not enough, not enough, not enough. Instead of feeling guilty about that, that should be our reminder, our warning. Oh my goodness, I have to get back to the vine. I have to get back to my creator, my source. That's what this is saying. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Man, I have felt withered so many times. So I'm just going to end by saying this. When you find yourself up against not enough, sit with the one who is. Say it again. When you find that you are not enough, when you hit that wall, or when you find that you are frustrated with the human race, sit with Jesus. Sit with the one who is enough. He will supply everything you need to live out the good work that you, each of you individually, and me, what we were created to do. I intentionally picked the song we're going to close with um, today, and it's called I Surrender. We sang it last week. But my challenge to all of us this morning is to surrender a few things. Maybe we need to surrender our unhealthy striving Maybe we need to surrender all those extras that we have added to ourselves. Maybe we need to surrender trying to do it in our own strength without sitting with our source and our creator. Maybe we need to surrender. Listen to this one. I had him highlight this one. Maybe we need to surrender our temporal, our temporary agendas for his eternal purposes. This body isn't going to last forever, but our souls are. Are we propelling forward a mission that takes care of people's souls? That's going to last forever. And this morning as we sing, I'm going to ask you to ask God to empower you to make God time a priority. Let's stand and sing. Also over here in the prayer corner, if you need prayer for this, if you're a striver and you're in an unhealthy place or you're just feeling 
the desperation of not being enough, there will be people over there that would happily partner with you in prayer.